So Sherry, I'm going to come unmute you. Say hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. How good to be with you all. <laughs> Do you have a candle lit near you? You know what? I was just, I was going to get up because I do always have a candle by my side. I it's figured not, I'm looking for matches right now, but I know it's okay. And all that. You are the match. You are the match. You are the candle. The so um, <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be with you. Every time I'm with you, it feels new um, because you're one of those few humans that's extremely present. So it's just fun to bounce off of your energy and absorb your energy. So um, this is really special that you took the time to come and hang out with all of us today. Thank you for doing that. So glad to be here. This is an extraordinarily attractive group. <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean, uh, in this 2D world, the back of my hair isn't brushed. I'm not really wearing real pants. I'm wearing and, a really uh, cute sweatshirt. And and I'm barefoot. Shorts, like so. you only have to do like this D and maybe a little bit like this up. So I did put on a little lipstick. I made sure my house was picked up, but <laughs> listen, you guys are a good looking bunch. Uh, it's true. And it's probably because the soul shines bright inside these, these humans. So, um, I know that some people are well aware of you and your you-ness, but some people here might not know a little bit about your backstory. So I thought what we would do today is two things and we'll see where the river takes us. One okay. is talk a little bit about your journey and two, really dig into what it means to have transformation in our life, because this is something that you are such a stand for. And I'm going to make sure that everybody's muted. Um, so first let's start with you and your own transformation journey, which really sums up your life. Yeah. And it's pretty awesome where your life so has crazy. been going. So tell us a little bit about the before and then the after and now the during. Well, first, let me say all these gems that I've excavated are literally post experience. I wasn't the wise sage during the midst of it as so often is in our human experience. But, you know, I knew early on, I wanted, I wanted to be significant, but it took lots of failure and heartache and rejection and disappointment for me to really understand what being significant really means what it really me meant to me. So, and, and what that looked like is like for a while, you know, I, for a while I wanted to be a doctor, not because I had this, you know, this craving for medical information, you know, or to take those kinds of classes or do that kind of studying, but because I liked, you know, it was kind of like a primetime TV version of doctoring I was interested in, you know, sweeping through the halls, answering mm -hmm. emergencies with my equipment. Um, so, so things like that would always sputter out for me really, really quickly. And I, I graduated from the university of Iowa, go Hawks. <laughs> and, um, I really, I, I really didn't have a plan, but I wanted to be important. So what did that look like? Is that a briefcase? Is that a, you know, a snappy business card? Um, and, and, and that led to literally, a. a so how many years, 14 year odyssey of crazy men and all kinds of different jobs. I mean, I, you know, as a fresh college graduate, I was in a typing pool at a t title company and I'm not a particularly good typist. <laughs> I've since improved now that we're in computer days and that's all we do, but I was not particularly good. So I always had that little white chalky, those little tapes all over, all yeah. over my hand. <laughs> um, from there, I was the assistant manager at a fancy toy store where like the toys cost as much as a condo and oh that's been out of business. Then I was the manager at a crappy toy store where you, you, you're allergic to everything, every product in there, um, you know, semis of, you know, working on Christmas Eve, semis of 
Cabbage Patch dolls coming in, women banging me over the head with their purse because we're, we've <laughs> sold out. Uh, and onto that, I was a 7-Eleven store. I was a supervisor trainee, but that's not a good as story as I literally had to manage a store for eight months. For eight months, I had to learn how to manage a store. And it's what I envision, not having been in the military, what I envision boot camp to be. Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And, and so just, just on this journey and just, then it'd be like, okay, I hate what I'm doing now. Okay. Move back in with mom and dad and my dog, Eddie Lou, she and I moved back in and, you know, then I, I just, I started to tune in and, and basically that journey led me to, okay, finally asking the question, what makes me excited? What, what do I feel passionate about? Well, I'm kind of bossy. I like to put all the pieces together. I like making people rehearse. I like making sure the show goes on. So, you know, I found my way into agency production and became a, a producer of television commercials. And that satisfied me for a while. And then the joy factor dropped down because I didn't care about hairspray. And I didn't want to spend 18 hours a day working on hairspray. It lights some people up and it lit me up for a while, but I ran out of gas. And then finally, through the, the miraculous, mystical, magical web of divine dreams, um, conjuring, led me to the door of Harpo Studios and the Oprah Winfrey Show. And I, I spent a 20 year career there starting over again at 35 years old, over again in a fairly entry level position with no power of any kind. I ended the, the last five years of the show, I was the executive producer. And then I was the co-president of Harpo Studios and, and helped Oprah um, reboot the own network for about five years until I left to begin my, my own thing, my own dream, my, my own destiny. So it's been quite a road I've traveled. It's literally like, I see Jennifer Lawrence like playing you and this is, <laughs> it's a movie. And I love that you walked us through how many of you type a one in the chat if you loved hearing the details that she worked as a manager at a toy store, she was a supervisor at 7-Eleven, and then from such an ordinary life comes the most extraordinary possibility, and that's what you are a lighthouse for, and it's so awesome, and we talked about that moment. And we're going to go back into the transformation because that's really where all the meat is. But first, I want you to tell them what happened that she chose you as that person? How did you become the quarterback of the, the well, biggest listen, possible mountain? Yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have, listen, if I had strategized that it would have blown up in my face. It was a very different kind of, you know, there, there were the promo people, that served the show people. And I was a promo person. So the crossing never, never did the twain meet, you know, so to speak. But I got some really great advice from my boss in advertising who said, it's gonna be a very competitive environment because it's so sparkly. You know, first of all, it's sparkly. You know, she's like, um, her, her, her star continues to rise. So there's gonna be, some competitiveness. There's going to be all those heightened emotions that happen in life when you're around uber success and big money and big possibility. It brings out the best in people. It brings out the worst in people. And I got this great advice to, he said, just do what's given to you um, with utter focus and don't worry about what the next step is. And he's like, don't try to strategize it. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to promote yourself. Just do what you've been given. And he goes, and I know that Oprah will pluck you out. And that's kind of what exactly what happened. 
I mean, every, you know, I'd turn around and someone would be like, well, we'd like you to do this job now. And I'd be like, oh, I wouldn't even ask, is it, do I get a raise? I would just go, okay, okay, I'm in, I'm in. And the reason why I could, I could walk that line with such faith without trying to control it or direct what was going to happen to me was because I knew I was finally on the right path. Like once I walked through those doors, I had enough work experience and life experience to know, oh, this is really good. This is everything about this is great. And, um, you know, the younger people, the younger staff would kind of be like, mm, I don't know, this is really hard. You know, like, like you know, w- without any perspective of life, I'm like, you think this is hard? We're paid to watch TV at our desks and take notes. You know what I mean? Uh, You know, so I had all this perspective. So I just sit there and go, you don't even know. But the thing, but the, but the piece of the puzzle was, it wasn't just that it was Oprah and Harpo Studios and the Oprah show, although that is pretty sexy, I admit. What it was, was I finally, I finally had like clicked into after all that trying to make things happen and trying to be important and trying to be significant, I finally clicked into like, what lights me up? I really like this producing. Do I like producing this? Not so much. What would I like to produce? Oh, real people, stories, like, you know, something that, oh, you know what? The sense of mission is going to be important to me. That's going to matter to me. That's going to light me up. That's the significance I was trying to define so poorly early on. Significance was knowing that what I was investing my heart, my soul, my precious time in mattered. And and, and it mattered to me. And I felt like it was a significant impact to the world. So what's such a marvel to me, and I want to go back into some of this deeper, but it's just such a marvel, really. It's like a spectacle to think that you were being asked to hold space for her, right? Like hold this space, lead this show, hold, hold space for me. Tell me where to go. Tell me where to be. Give me your advice. You know, like that's almost impossible for a person to be given that task and then to do it successfully without feeling complete and utter imposter syndrome and boy did you do it well right (laughs) oh there's plenty of times where I'm like oh my god I mean listen when she brought me in to promote me into the 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 top job I literally said I think you're making a mistake I think I don't think this is the right decision I I think this is a you know because I knew that like people who had spent their lives promoting themselves to get that top job were going to blow a gasket. I'm like, uh, this is not, this is so not. What was be. her response to that? Um, well, of course she was flabbergasted that I would come out and say such a thing. Cause who would, but me, you know, uh-uh, I don't think that's a good, let me listen. Let me be your friend here. This is not a good decision. And she's like, uh, I'm pretty sure it is a good decision. And I'm, I, I asked her to write on a piece of paper write on a piece of paper why this is why this is right, why I'm the right person. And I framed it and it was on my desk for the, for the rest of my, my working days with her, which was, you're going to rise and soar because you know my heart. And then I went, okay, that I can trust. That I can trust because wow. that mattered to me understanding what it was, not what I wanted to produce. What does she want to produce? What is her message? How do we serve her mission? How do I align, you know, my little Sherry mission with, with, with the big Oprah mission? Because that's really what's happening. You know, it's happening right here with all of us together, aligning our, our little missions are coming underneath Kathy's big mission, right? In this, in this moment together. But yeah. Once, once she said that, I'm like, okay, I can trust in that. I don't really have all the skills. I don't really have all the experience. 
you know, people are going to be really PO'd that they got passed over and that's going to be fun to deal with, but that I can trust in. Every Um, time you tell me this story, that always makes me cry because the more that I have journeyed into the beyond, whenever I meditate, whenever I come home to center, what I am so aware of is that what we really are as a soul is no one, nowhere, no thing in no place and no time. We are this awareness, this pure consciousness. Right. And when we are dropped into that place, nobody cares if you were a supervisor at 7-Eleven, if you have black hair or blonde hair, if you're 39 or 14 or 47, you know my heart, period, boom. End of sentence. sentence. And this is where the magic all took place for you. And so let's really like, let's witness that. Let's really witness that that's the key to unlock the most mystical transcendent experience. You know, my heart, that's, that was the qualification that I was looking for. And you then knew you got me. I can trust that. Not, oh, because, you know, the packages you've been putting out or the da 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 Yeah. Because you had been producing before that. You had already moved up and up and up and there was other people. Yeah. And it I wasn't been, about that. I'd been, I'd skipped over steps, you of know. Of course. <laughs> so I was like, eh, okay, now I'm supervising people, but I only produced two shows. Okay. <laughs> like it was, it was, it was crazy like that. But I always went back to that original advice. What do you want me to do? let me, let me do my best at it. Okay. Uh, Okay. You know, and it really wasn't until that moment in Oprah's office when I was like, this this is not a good decision. Let me help you here. Um, Let me help you. Miss Winfrey, I have something to say to you. You're wrong about you. Somebody else was in the room when she made that offer. And afterwards they're like, uh, you know, when somebody's offering you something like really telling them it's a bad idea. And I go, (laughs) Oh, I will always speak my truth. I will always speak my heart. I'm not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes here. It's really massive because I think that what's happened, especially in the more immediate past, but in general, to me, Oprah is, she's more powerful than any president. She's more powerful than a whole freaking country, right? So it's like, you're talking to I don't know, the third person from God. And you're like, um, I don't know. Like, let's, it's just, but again, (laughs) God would be like, let's have this conversation, right? Like, cool. Like let's, let's get into it. So here's where I want to go back to, because it's also so much a part of your book, the beautiful no, and you, you alluded to it where you went from job to job to job. And you said, and then I finally asked myself a question, like, what do you actually desire? What actually feels fun And oh my God, is it so good. It's so good. And I want people to hear this because so often we are busy and we are busy. And that which we say yes to means we are saying no to something else. And finally, you had this bigger thought, which is instead of getting the next job, let me ask a question. What really lights me up? That's a bold, courageous pivot to start asking a question like that. And then you said, I started dancing in the world of dreams. So let's talk about that because that's yeah. everything. Yes. And, and you, the way you're describing it, I, I sound a little together, more together than I was. And that is looking back on it. I can see that's what happened, but what it looked like in my actual life. I love someone who said, so the lesson is when Oprah calls to hire me, I should tell her no. Yeah. T- t- do what I did. Um, <laughs> Um, that is so funny. That is such a crack up. Um, what it looked like in reality was misery. It didn't look like me sitting down with a, you know, a latte, you know, having this soulful conversation with myself. What it looked like was misery. It looked like I hate doing this. I can't get out of bed. You know, all I want to do is drown myself in cheese. Oh, this is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't stand, you know, that's what it looked like. That's what it looked like. And um, those yearnings for creativity, 
those yearnings for expression, for, you know, putting something together that was meaningful and sharing it were undefined by me. Like I, I couldn't grasp at it, but I can look back on, on it now and see it very clearly. But, you know, at the time it was, it was just, I'd start down a path and, and end up at misery, start down a path and end up at misery. And I could not make myself make a change until I was miserable. Like, it wouldn't be like, yeah, I'm not sure this is for me. It would be like, I hate this. I can't, you know, I can't go on. It would be much more dramatic and, and, and much, um, much more chaotic. And I don't, you know, I don't, I can't totally answer why that was. Is it, was it my Midwestern way of, you know, turning everything into my path to retirement? Like, I'll give you, I'll stick with you (laughs) until, you know, until I can't take another step. You know, is it, was it the fear of like, well, I don't know if I'm going to find anything better than this. So I don't want to let go of it. I don't know really what um, was churning, but it certainly wasn't a full cup of self-esteem. And it certainly wasn't, you know, a real um, sense of my own agency. It it wasn't, it was, it was a little bit like a a leaf on the wind. You know what I'm saying? But Mm -hmm. I can, I can see what would happen is I would be forced. It's like the universe would be like, okay, we're going to make you so miserable in the next two weeks that you're going to have to make a change Mm -hmm. or be able to go on. And then a change would have to be made. And speaking of being forced, a big crux of the beautiful no, there's a lot of different beautiful no's, but one of them gave you your wings because you got this huge rejection from a job you thought that was the dream job. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah. So if I'm, if I'm telling you, can imagine at 35, I still haven't totally zeroed in on it. I'm now a trained agency producer, but I've left to freelance because I didn't really like the clients I was on. And, and I really, I, I knew it, this wasn't the end game. And I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do now? I thought I had figured this out. So freelancing, for those of you who freelance, is very challenging because you're also a salesperson. You're not just doing the work. You must sell your skills for money. And you must make calls and say, please buy my skills for money, which turned out I wasn't so great at. So now I have no money. I don't think I'm going to be able to make my rent. Um, I have this skilled ability to produce television commercials, um, but I have now put myself in very desperate straits. And I finally got this big interview at a top agency in Chicago through a friend. And so she had really talked me up and I went in and it was like, the guy all but hired me in the room. It was so gorgeous. It was so beautiful. Like I I, I tried not to cry and embarrass myself. Like, thank you so much. Cause he was like, you're perfect. I'm gonna pay you top dollar. I'm gonna put you on all the best accounts. You're exactly what I need. And I mean, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it now. Remember when I told you that hairspray wasn't lighting me up? I was over that. It's like, I need money. I need money and I need a job. (laughs) I don't care what it is, you know, and you're going to give me this fancy job. That's so great. I left there. I was floating because it was the answer to my financial, my life's messed up again, prayers. So through the party with my friends at our local watering hole, pop the champagne, you know, then let's not get ahead of ourselves, but oh, this is so great. You know, this is, this is, I will make this meaningful. I will find a way to make this right within my soul. And then he never calls. And he doesn't call this day or that day or this day or that day. And finally the form letter arrives from the HR department saying we're not hiring at this time. Yep. It's a, it was a blow now. Oh yeah. In retrospect, it sounds like it was a blow. It was like, a, Oh my God, I'm going to have to move back in with my parents. Luckily I have them to, to lean on, but now it's humiliating and embarrassing. And, you know, I, I just feel like the biggest loser. 
I'm on my couch watching soaps going, oh my God, how did you, how have you come to this moment? And I, I, rem I do remember feeling like my hands were open, like I'm out of moves. I don't know what else to do. Um, I, th I thought this was solved. I feel as low as I've ever felt and I don't have an answer. I don't know what to do next. And shortly thereafter, there's a message on my answering machine. This is so-and-so from the Oprah Winfrey show. We were cleaning out a closet and found your resume and your VHS tape of commercials. Will you come in and talk to us about freelancing here? And I'm like, oh my God. Now it was a, a little while later. I mean, it might've even been a couple years when I put this together that, oh, if I had gotten that big ad job, which was, I think paying, I don't know. Every time I think about it, it gets, it's, it's hard for me to remember what money was like. Because right, there's inflation. It was probably five. I mean, it was probably like 65, 70 grand, like, woo. And um, it would have solved everything. And I'm like, if he would have hired me and I had gotten the insurance, the benefits, the money relief, the big fancy clients, that personal egoic sense of importance again, like I have a place to go every day and, and I'm senior, you know, whatever, I'm a senior something. Would I have left that to go take a chance freelancing at the Oprah show? I will tell you right now, I would not have. There are some who would have said, not me. I would, I would, I would, I, there's no way. And I know that. So what I realized is that is the most beautiful no I've ever gotten in my life. That no made it possible for everything that happened after. And then I started to think, what if this is a foundational spiritual principle? What if rejection, disappointment, he doesn't, he's not that into you. That's not going to work out. Uh, no, this isn't the right job. No doors shutting, doors shutting, rejection, rejection. What if those no's are all beautiful? What if we can figure that out for ourselves and kind of collapse time? I think of all the times I've spent being miserable over those closed doors. What if I knew almost I had my human moment and then I pulled myself together and said, oh, this is going to be interesting to see how this turns out because I know, I know the universe has my back. I know this is leading to something amazing. I'm just gonna get really curious to see what is the next chapter in this story. It's so unbelievably good. Everybody type a one in the chat if that just hits you right in the heart. Amber. chills, feeling something like, whoa, how, how would you even put it in words? Type a word in the chat to describe how that makes you feel. Surrender, destiny, magic, safe, trust, believe, hopeful, inspired, possible, encouraged, letting go, trusting the divine. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's and what's available to us. I mean, Kathy, you talk about this all the time, but that's what's available to us. That was the big proof. That was the, oh my gosh, there is something going on. There is, when I had applied years before to the Oprah show and sent that resume and that reel, and it was on a lark. I knew TV and, and commercials, very different, completely different businesses. And I knew that I didn't have the experience they were looking for. And sure enough, that's what they told me. You don't have the experience we're looking for. And I let it go. I'm like, okay, yeah, I got that. I'm certainly not. I mean, I don't know how to start over in television. So I guess I continue on this path, but never in a, can you imagine? Cause here's what happened. This is how the universe works. The person who rejected me years before who ran that department left. They brought in somebody who had been at MTV who wanted produ promo producers with agency experience. 
She's like, mm, I don't want to look at the same people who are from TV stations. Bring, bring in somebody who has agency experience. Well, they'd never considered anybody like that. So they're like, whoa, mad scramble, digging through the old closet and they find me. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. But, but, but that was waiting there. I had the impulse to apply. I didn't get it. That, that, that resume and that VHS tape just sat in that closet. Off I went, you know, bemoaning my fate. You know, the bit, you know, just like one, you just see how the universe is like, okay, you owe my so much drama you're creating, Sherry. So much drama. Have a little trust. There's a timing. There's a timing. There's a timing. What I needed to be doing was managing my mood and enjoying the days I, I had. You know, it's like, I have this day. Yeah. What am I going to do with it? Because and I know it's all getting lined up. And what's really extraordinary to watch the unfolding and the rising is that really that was the before all of that every and, and Sherry by the way let's just to make everything super clear so as executive producer of that show even when she was producing before she was executive producer you know she's sitting in the living room with the greatest mind society has in this moment anybody from Eckhart Tolle to Steven Spielberg these are the people that Sherry can now there's a relationship at a high level, but beyond the fact that that was what that was, what I'm witness to now, what the world is getting witness to is that was the precursor to the Sherry Salata show. Like you are now finally taking your seat on the dais and saying, hmm, I guess if that was where I was, I was there because of something in me. It was who I am. Yeah. And I learned all of these pieces to sort of put together a composite in addition to what I already knew. And now Sherry is writing books and she's teaching people how to design their life and has a very successful following and a very engaged following. And it has so much more to do with you than a job that you had. Like it is just so self-evident. Everybody's been writing such nice things about you. One of the things that people keep writing is just how genuine you are, how sincere Aww. you are. And um, that is, it just speaks volumes and it, it, it all lines up. Everything lines up that again, you are such a soul. I want to talk about manifesting dreams because yeah. this is something that you are so good at doing, helping other people do. And, um, I think you and Oprah are both really good at that. Like she's great at saying to somebody like, like, I will wave the wand over your head because I know you're meant for this and boom, right? And you do that too. That I mean, I think in a way you did that together for a period of time. But what does that look like when you're saying you were working all these jobs and then right. something shifted? For somebody who's in that place now, for somebody who didn't get that call yet from the Oprah show that they were cleaning out the closet, right. how do we begin to understand how to access the path of the beautiful magic that just starts to unfold before us. So I am on the path along with all of you and I am tweaking and figuring it out with all of you. So I can tell you what I think I, what I, what my knowing is right now is that I thought for a very, very long time, I needed to, that it was, that, that dream manifestation was a doing business. And that isn't quite right. It, it's definitely a being business. It is spiritual work, always spiritual work. You know, get, get everything about what we're talking about is spiritual work. And that if your number one job is lining up with that force, and what does that look like? That means that you're focused on the story you tell to your, your, yourself in your head about yourself. You're choosing your vocabulary very, very in a focused way. You're going, oh, oh, uh-uh, not helpful. Stop that. Stop that old thread where mm, you're so this, you're so that, you don't look right, you're not enough. Whatever those stories are, you begin to excavate those stories. You take a look at them. You bless them because they thought they were trying to help you and you send them on their way and you deliberately choose new words and a new story that you're going to tell yourself about your new dream. 
You're not going to manifest your new dreams while you're singing those old songs. That is the truth. And when I tell you that that discombobulated way that I found my way to like my dream, the beginning of my dream at 35, it's because I was too busy trying to do and make it happen instead of doing that spiritual work that I'm talking about. Like, what are you saying to yourself? You know, um, how are you managing your mood, managing your vibration? How are you stirring the dream pot? You know, it, dreaming isn't one and done. It's a muscle. It's a daily practice. It's like, what do I want now? It's like allowing yourself to just grasp onto that little bit of hope that you can live the life of your dreams. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to figure out the details. You're going to go leave the details to the divine as you understand it, but you're going to have fun dreaming up the what, and then raising your energy to match that. That's it. That's it. That's the secret. And, oh, I can say that right now. And tomorrow I could be in a big stew about something and have to walk myself back and say, you're creating something right now. Is this what you want? A big chaotic jangle or, or delaying the dream? Oh no, you want to be curious, 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 like, okay. You're like, whoo, the party's about to start. The guests are coming. Whoo, what's about to happen? And then just noticing with great appreciation, the stuff that's already working and the good stuff that drops in your lap. And that's what you pay attention to, not, not what hasn't happened yet. It's so good. I read something from Gabby Bernstein earlier today. She said, worry is a prayer for chaos. Yes. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. So oh, listen. good. And I'm, I'm from a long line of worriers. I mean, my mom and dad were worry, 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 worry. And even now I have to make my dad, my 84 year old father do breathing exercises with me on the phone. I'm like, why, why it's now it's a pattern that's so ingrained. I said, I almost can't talk you out of your worries, even though I can show you that 99% of them never came to pass, but worry is a form of prayer. Yeah. And, um, the thing that's really incredibly powerful about this First of all, we can never talk about this enough because this really is, this is the move right here. Everything in the quantum field, there is a potential vibrational match for whatever your vibration is, right? And that's why you're one of my go-to examples when I wanna viscerally feel this. I think about the conversation we had once where you said I was just as worthy when I was standing at 7-Eleven selling cups of coffee as I was later on when I was looking at tape and telling Liz Gilbert where to sit or whatever else, right? That's right. That, that to me is one of the biggest leaps is the, you are going to receive that which you are worthy yeah. of receiving. If you have a mailbox, and the slot is this big. You can put letters in it, but not packages. It's just not big enough to that's receive good, a package. That's good. Yes. I just thought of that yesterday. That's <laughs> really good. Well, that, that is, that's the worthiness gap. Like right. you, you just will only let so much in. Right. So that's why I love going back to no ego, no self, nowhere, no thing, nada. You are this awareness. And when you're in a state of awareness, your consciousness, your pure consciousness, right? How can you say you're not worthy? Who are you even? Anyway, you're no one, you're nothing, no thing, no one, no nada, no place, nowhere. Of course you're worthy. <laughs> you are an extension of, of divinity, of divine light, of goodness, of all of that. But that is interesting. And so I wanna talk about, because you are so um, well-versed in so many different languages that really help us speak this into the world. And part of it is, people don't even allow themselves to ask, right? We shun our desires. So we don't even have the courage to ask for what we want. Why? Because we don't feel that we're worthy enough to receive them. So we better dim them down. So it's the asking and then it's the worthiness of stepping into so that you actually are that mailbox that's available for those big packages. How can you explain that in your own words? Yeah. Um, 
here's what I notice. I notice this with longtime friends. I notice this with women I'm working with that we, we, we need to check ourselves and look for patterns of telling, continuously telling our stories of defeat, disappointment, heartache, heartbreak. I used to be married. He was awful. Uh, I used to have money. I, he stole it all. You know, wh whatever those stories are, we almost feel like we have to get them out on the table when we meet somebody. It's like, okay, yeah, but here's what I've been through. And, 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 and that's very dramatic the way I'm describing it. Although true, true, true. Um, it's like the stories that you are telling yourself about your life are casting your fate. If you believed that you would never do it again. If you really, really believed that you would <sighs> never do it again. You are casting your fate. You are, you are, you are, um, you're a conjurer. You're a Merlin. You're a magician. This is, if you want to ha have a magical life, put on your magical glasses and start seeing that your life is super magical already. And then, and then get to your dream pot and light the fires and, and make your life a ritual, a ceremony of calling in the magic. And it, it certainly does not begin with ongoing storytelling about how life has done you wrong. You got to find a way to acknowledge, feel it fully, excavate it all, all the poison, allow yourself to feel it and go to the fire and light it up. I love it. I love the stirring the dream pot. That's got to be your talk show or it's got to be your next book or something. Um, you're going to love your time with Joe Dispenza. And I've learned so much from him and loved that week with him. And one of the things that he taught me was this idea that they took a magnetometer and were measuring eggs, all kinds of eggs from reptile eggs to goose eggs. And they even did it with women, um, pregnant women. And they found that there was always a positive charge where the head was and a negative charge where the feet were. And when there's a positive and a negative charge, it creates a magnet, it creates a magnet, literally. It's amazing. Like we, we yeah. really, we really have been conditioned to believe a lie, which is that matter changes matter. And when we are in the body and we're not in the head, guess what? They don't feel any magnet. When you're in the past, when you are biologically and chemically grounded into your old feelings, there's no magnet on that magnetometer. Isn't that insane? That means that when you're thinking what you, what you thought yesterday and oh. you're feeling what you felt yesterday, you're in fight or flight, you're in the body. So there's only the negative charge. So there is no magnet. So what we really have to get is we are not matter, right? And we can't make a dream come from matter because matter can't change matter. And when we're in the body, we're now matter, we're not energy. We are energy and energy makes things. So if you want the lights to be on, you literally have to light up here. And then we, we are vibration, right? You can feel when someone walks in the room where there's a, there's a magnet, there's something that's being pulled towards them, right? So we're always pulling things towards us and like attracts like. So it's important that we really get that in order to do this, we have to take that journey across the river of overcoming this past predictable person, personality. And right. it's, to it's have the same, to just live that same life over and over and over again. And all our power is right here, right here, right here, right now, right now, right now. This is our powerful moment. And the past, it's like it never happened. It, it's just, it, it's like, you know, the, the only productive use of the past that I have found is when you can overcome what's already in our DNA, our survival strategy is to only remember the negative stuff to give that a, a, a big arena. But if you can just be 
just almost like chanting appreciation for every single wonderful, blessed, beautiful thing that's ever happened to you. That's a good use of it. You know, in fact, even for those of you who are writers and are working on your memoir, there are times when I'm like, eh, you know, I, 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 I separate myself energetically from my yes. old stories. Yes. Like I I'm now, even when I'm talking to you, it's like, I'm talking about somebody else. You know, I'm talking about, oh, this is me. I got, I have this amazing story for you about what happened to this girl. Yep. Because I don't want to activate all that. No. Stuff. You know, I, well, I, so it's different. Like I, it's, it's more of a, um, let me hold up some either. So it's a rallying cry or a cautionary tale, depending on where you sit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what we know from psychology is that when we revisit the past without an emotional charge to it, it turns into pure wisdom. Yes. It's just wisdom. So that's when it becomes a rallying cry yes. or it's a tale of like, this is yes. what I've learned from it. I was talking to Priyanka Chopra last week and she, I asked her a question about where this embodied confidence comes from in her. It's like not confidence that I've ever seen. It's something beyond confidence. And she said, my parents used to ask me, what do you think? What do you feel? And never shame me for my answer. And they were both doctors in the military. And I just felt that they respected me as a child. So I always felt that my words had value. And I said to her, you just helped me rewrite my story. You just gave me a gift. And she said, what's that? I said, because I grew up being my parents' therapist. And I felt so burdened by the fact that they would tell me my mom's manic depression and she's suicidal and my dad's cheating and he's telling me the details of his sex life and escapades. And I felt so violated by this. And in that moment, I said to her, oh my God, I've never put together why I am so comfortable. I feel completely at ease talking to anybody. I don't care where you've been, what, what doctorate you have. I just can be in the room. And she said, I'm so glad I could help you reframe that. That is such a gift for you. And I'm like, where would it have helped me to just keep being like, you see what they did? I'm a victim, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. beauty in that, beauty in that. Yeah, reframing is a great tool for that. And also, you know, there, there, there's undealt with wounds and pain. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to bring it out to the light. Shame, <laughs> shame's a big one. Shame, shame is a dream killer. You got to, you know, bring it all out to the light, you know, witness it, be witnessed, bring it to the light, realize, especially like in a group like this, you start to see that, okay, it's a shared human experience. I am not the only one. I'm not the only one who struggles with this, with self-worth, with um, not enoughness, with the pain of my childhood the disappointments and things that don't work out. I'm not the only one who's had awful things, experienced awful things. I'm not the only one who's walked through fire. And when we start to witness that in one another, all of a sudden our hearts get lighter. And I think I told you this, Kathy, like for me, I'm a behind the scenes person. Like the thought of, first of all, releasing my memoir and then having to go out and talk about it. <laughs> oh my God. It was like hives and sweating. And, and I was like, Oh, why did I do this? I didn't need to do this. Why did I do this? Lots of resistance, lots of resistance. And then I was like, well, too late sister, you're gotta go. So off I go. And here's what I'm going to tell you in two or three weeks time. I am like, Oh, I see this was a healing for me. It would take something of this magnitude, publishing a memoir and being on a book tour for me to, first of all, even allow this kind of healing. You know, I, I thought I'd been there, done that. I produced every story, every story. But when I'm sitting there with groups of people and we're sharing our stories and I'm like, and I just see, oh, when we bring light to this, when we witness one another, I'm the one who's healed. I'd walk away from a, 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 one of those things and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I feel, I feel 10 years younger. I feel lighter. I feel like I'm more aligned in my spirit. Yeah. I feel like well, I don't care about any of that. I'm not like trying to withhold. I'm not trying to disguise. Yeah. I'm not trying to put on a, a mask. 
I'm like, yeah, there it is. It's all in there. All in there. I don't know if you've ever read this book. You probably have. You probably are best friends with her. You know everybody. But I'm reading this book right now because a friend of mine posted last week a quote. And I was like, whatever book that is, I need it. And uh, it's called Women, Food, and God. Do you know this book? Oh, yeah. Janine Roth. Yeah. I mean, how did I like not know who she was? This book is so unbelievable. And she's basically saying that we resist so much feeling the feeling of abandonment or, or shame or whatever the bad feeling is. And so we fill it up with a Snickers bar or scrolling on our phone or obsessing over moving somewhere again, reading the house. And she basically has helped me just reading this book in the last week. Cause she said, when you go toward the pain, a, you realize it doesn't annihilate you and B there's something bigger than the pain holding the pain, which is integrated. And you're free in that place. You're completely right. free. You're not running from yourself. Can you talk about okay. that for a second? Well, first of all, I am going to tell you about the amazing Janine Roth because it's perfect for what we're saying. So there's Janine Roth. She has a terrible, terrible, terrible eating disorder. Terrible, terrible, yeah. terrible, yeah. terrible. And uh, she heals herself and then heals millions of women around the world, women, food, and God. She, she has uh, some other books on that, which don't come to mind because- um, Then how about this one? She and her husband lose all their money in the Bernie Madoff freaking scheme. She's built all this money, best-selling author, world loses all their money. Oh my God. Broke and not young. Then now she's battling cancer. Yeah, I heard that. And you see, and you can follow her on Instagram and see how she's moving through it. But you know, here's, here's the lesson. We cannot protect ourselves from the humanness of this experience. Yes. There's not enough protection of warding off worrying anxiety that we can do to protect ourselves from the experience of being human. We might as well go after the life of our dreams, build resilience and understand that we can walk through fire whenever it presents itself. Like, like Janine, that that is the path of transformation. And we're going to have all the human experiences, the grief, the pain, the disappointment, the sorrow, and also the joy, the triumph, the fun, the the peace, the contentedness. It's so good. I'm doing a class right now with John Kabat-Zinn, who I'm also like obsessed with. And I just love whenever he says something so powerful and so simple as you don't have to push the river, just sit beside it, just sit beside it. And then, and then he says something like, if you're so eager to leave the present moment for a better moment, are you ever going to be present in any moment? Because you're so sure that another moment is better than the present moment. It's like, it is this feeling of it's, it's not that it's about attaining joy all the time. It's a, it's an equanimity. It's a things are as they are. And yeah. this gets to be my juicy moment to be with whatever's here. And like you said, there will be that humanness of in every moment, there's probably a shadow side of some grief or some pain and also the swooping birds overhead and the, and the abundant feeling you have that almost makes you want to go to fear because you feel so much joy about something that it's almost hard to let that in too. And if we can just sit by the river and just listen and look at it rather than pushing it or putting a boulder in the way, it's like, it just where are we going? That's really, really great. I'm writing that down from my little notebook. You well, don't have to push the river. That's I, all his. Years, years and years pushing the river. And isn't that interesting that even what you were saying just now, we're never going to be in our, our lives are going to remain unlived if we're unwilling to sit and, and suck the juice out of the present moment. Yep. You're, you're, you, it, it's, it's an unlived experience. If you're not going to be like, ah, breath in, breath out. Here's this moment. It's good in this moment. Nothing is wrong. And when you touch ground with this feeling of equanimity, for me, 
I will, I would rather choose being in center, even if it means that something I have to face is an, is a, a difficult feeling, but at least I'm in integrity rather than some, well, it has to look like this. Cause that for sure would feel better. It's like, no, nothing to me is scarier than being out of that alignment where I can just sit with what is like, I can't do it anymore. It's so exhausting. And then, yeah, like you said, you're not living your life. And speaking of living your life, um, I want to touch on what you've been helping people to do and, and what you do so well in your own life, which is designing your life. Oh. And I want you to tell them first where that even came from, because it's such a great anecdote. Oh, and that's such a talk, great story. And then I want to talk about how we actually can design our life. Well, I remember, okay. So for, for, you know, when I, when I look back on my years at the Oprah show, I almost can't re- remember most of it because it was a blaze and it was very fast paced, high stress. And so, uh, certainly I was, I was pushing the river. No question about it. And Jerry Seinfeld had come to the show and we were backstage by the control room. And I would say he and Oprah and I were talking, but really he and Oprah were talking and I was standing there. And, you know, she was kind of bemoaning our schedule. Well, now we got to go upstairs because, you know, you know, you, you, you throw two weddings a day, you know, with 500 person audiences and, oh my God. and, and then you'd go upstairs and have four hours of meetings on tomorrow, the next day, next oh week. It was, it was a lot. And we were, and Oprah was talking about that. And I probably was chiming in like, yeah, dear, it's so much. It's so hard. It's so <laughs> and Jerry looked at Oprah and said, wow, but this life is yours to design. It's yours to design. Hmm. Hmm. And later on, we're like, oh my God, it's like Jerry took us to task. Like, but it's yours to design. What are you, what are you saying? It's yours to design. You don't like how it's going, but it's yours to design. It's too stressful. Your schedule isn't right, but, but it's yours to design. Listen, clearly I've never forgotten that. Out of all the moments I can't remember, people like, do you remember when I was on the show? I'm like, no, I'm so sorry. And no, I don't know anybody because it's like a blur. But Oh my God, I've never forgotten that. And it, and it sits with me because I would be the first person to say that I have no control over my schedule, that it's just from dawn till dusk. And, you know, I have meetings from eight to noon. And then on the day, people need me, you know, my family needs it. You know, I'd be the first person to say I'm at the effect of everybody else in every other situation, that I'm not the manager that I'm not the creator, but of course I am. These are all the yeses I said yes to. And and so it's yours to design. So, you know, I only really, it's like, this is the only conversation I wanna have. The only, the reason why I like this conversation so much is because I need it the most. I need to keep reminding myself, what is it you want? How are you gonna get there? What is the energy you want to surround yourself with? What are the like-minded travelers that you want to be on this path with? I'm just really not interested in anything less than that anymore. I can't sit around with people who want to complain the whole time. No, I can't do it. I don't like, I want to spray myself. Like, I don't want that on me. And, And it's not because I'm better than, it's because I've been there. I know what that yields, a big mess and a lot of unhappiness and a a lack of appreciation for this wondrous, magical experience we're given. So yeah, yours to design. So I think about that a lot. I think a a lot about when I have that old pattern language of what I have to do. I have to, I'm so busy, blah, 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 da, 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 because I have so much patterning around that. I have to do that focused attention that I was talking about earlier. I got to pay attention to what I'm saying. I got to pay attention to the story I'm telling myself because all my time is free time. I make all the choices. I, the, the more pauses and space I can put in my life now, the better. 
And you know what taught me that, Kathy? It's the whole world shutting down over a pandemic. Because even when I think I've got it, then I really can't do anything and go anywhere. I'm like, wow, this is space. I was kidding myself before. I was kidding myself. So it's an ongoing, it's an on, you know, here's what it is. It isn't like that old way. It's very much a, a patriarchal thing where you make a list of goals and you check them off and check them off. And when you're done checking them off, off, you're a superhuman being. The art of the path of transformation is life management. It is an ongoing tweaking, checking in. How does this feel? Does this feel good? How am I feeling about this? Like, and, and let me, does this feel better? Okay, I'm going to do this because this feels better. It, it is it isn't like I'm going to, you know, do this practice every day for the rest of my life. It's like, hmm, I might rearrange some things, but I'm going to build my list of practices that support the life that I say I want. And I'm going to pay attention to what my pattern, my thought patterns are around it. So designing your life is really a commitment to presence. And how do I feel? How do I feel? How do I feel? Yeah, it's amazing. And it's so often that we don't design it based on how does this really feel? It's more like, well, I've looked at what I think is possible or what I think is practical or what I think I should do. And then we wonder why we feel like we need an extra, you know, donut or more rosé or we scroll our phone longer. It's like we are Harold in the purple crayon and we get to draw this out. Like what would feel so good and so exciting because when that enthusiasm lights up, that's the juice that's going to help you magnetize other people to it and just buckle up because that's where you step into the unknown. And it's amazing. It's a ride. Um, one little thing I would add to that, and which is really important is lots of compassion. I still have days when I just binge watch something and grouse a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's a day, not a way of life. And I always come back to compassion. Like, of course there's human stuff going on there. There's, there's the events of the world going on. I just don't want them to create my life anymore. Yeah. Well, part of being present is not running away from feeling a feeling. And sometimes you're going to need to feel the feeling for 14 hours. And sometimes it's eight days. And that's part of it. This, this idea that we actually need to be productive all the time keeps us from being productive. That's again, that's the shame. Like who am I to slow down? It's like, who says you shouldn't binge watch a show and give yourself a total mind break and watch some, you know, bachelor, like who says that's bad? Who decided that? Like that we need to be, I was talking to Jock Pepin earlier today and we were talking about being European and, and his love of food, his love of cheese, how you said that before you could just bathe yourself in cheese. And he said, they've actually done studies and they found out like, as much as people say like cheese is going to kill you, dairy is going to, he's like, they actually did studies and found out if you're eating certain kinds of cheese with really good ingredients and, and, and whatever it is, he said, it's, in moderation, it's actually good for you, right? Like all of these things. And we talked about how in Europe, there's such a lingering around food. There's a, a deepening, there's a joy, there's a settling in to food and bread and conversation. And he said, in most French people with his French, he's like, they're not obese. Like they know how to enjoy their life. And that's part of being productive is like, you wanna be the best on your block at enjoying life. Like that's what that's makes right. you, right? And um, I think that it's very, one of the things you said about shame is what I see, which is interesting, is that one of the biggest pieces of shame that comes up for people is the shame around being happy. And who am I to stop and watch a show? Who am I to even dream a dream? I should be this, I should be that. Joy is actually our default. We know how to turn on the music and let ourselves go. We know how to marvel at things. When Look at children, look at the way that, and then we, we stop ourselves, which is so out of alignment, out of integrity. So I find that really interesting. I wonder what you have to say about that, the, the idea of having shame around having too much joy. 
Well, listen, there's a great expression from one of our fave spiritual teachers, Abraham Hicks, which is how good can you stand it? Yes. Yes. I mean, that's all you're going to allow in. How good can you stand it? And when you'd be like, well, what does that mean? You know, no, we, we have, we have a practice capacity for happiness. And in order to receive more, to feel more happiness, to attract more joy into our lives, we've got to work on expanding that. Like, uh, you know, here, and, and, and it, it goes back to what we were talking about that you, there's, there's not enough worrying you can do to ward off the human experience. You know, everybody, everybody on this Zoom can attest to, you can't, you can't skip around tragedy. You know, people are going to die. It's awful things are going to happen and you are going to still have to walk the human experience, but how are you going to do it? That's the question. So, you know, taking a look at what is your capacity for happiness? Why do you drop that ceiling down? Is it because you're afraid you're going to be disappointed? That's possible. Or you felt so unhappy so many times that you don't want to get your hopes up again, or you just don't, you, 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 you dismiss happiness as a fluff, fluffery, duffery Hallmark card, and you don't see it as this vibrant, powerful stance, happiness. It's this energy of just joy and wonder and contentment and peace and kind of just falling in love with yourself and your life experience. What if we made that the thing? What if we made that the choice and then it becomes the compass? When we were talking about those early days and I said, oh, misery was my compass. That's what I was doing. I wouldn't make a move compass wise until I was so miserable I couldn't stand it. But what if we said happiness is my North Star, happiness is my compass, happiness is my daily choice because it's mine to design. So what are the practices? What are the things? What am I going to allow in the people, the content, the food, the experiences? What am I going to allow in that I know that's going to support my choice of happiness? That's the, that's the detective game. Mm. The detective work of transformation. That's the fun. Like, what is it? What is it? It's so, so, so good. Everything you just said. One of the best things that's ever hit my eardrums is what you just said in the last four, five minutes. And it makes me think about the idea that we talk so much in this program about radical empathy, you know, and having empathy for other people. And what I just want to do to simplify it so much is to, to have us see that in this conversation, we've been talking about vibration and we just talked about joy and we've talked about fear and so much of the fear is what keeps us from being in a state of joy, but there's really only two things there's a positive and a negative charge, right? So it's either fear or love. And the thing is you guys, that when we are vibrating from love, right? When we're not in the place of trying to protect ourselves from our desires and therefore we're so self-involved because we're really not in the flow and we are trying to defend ourselves from everything. And we're not this positive charge up here in the state of creation. When we're not in that place, we're, we're not in a, in, a, in a vibration of love, but when we are in a vibration of love, whatever it is that brings you joy, if what brings you joy is beating necklaces, if what brings you joy is making candles, if what brings you joy is gathering people to go on nature walks, you don't even need to do any somersaults around the radical empathy and who's your client. It's called literally being in that vibration. Everyone wants to be around it. That is radical empathy. That's getting over yourself and into the flow of a vibration that feeds other people. Love literally loves people into life. It literally gives people nutrition on a level that they need so badly. And when we vibrate that way, not only does all the magic come together, but you can build any business from that place. That Because that is the epitome 
of empathy for other people is moving out of our protective mode and into the love. Just that is the highest vibration, but it means taking your hands off that retaining wall and diving in. And Sherry, you're like my greatest, you're one of the greatest teachers in my life. Every time I talk to you, I feel like I arrive at like a knowing that like, I didn't know that I knew. Same, same, same. We're soulmate friends. I told you, this is what Sherry, I say, you're like a shaman. I don't say that about anybody else. And I, I know other people who do similar things in their energy, but you, that for whatever reason, that's how I talk about you. I, it's just what you are. And I love watching you know the truth about who you are more and more and just continue to give it. It's awesome. Love you, Kath. Love, I you. love you. Thank you for being here today for such a long time. This was so delicious. Thank you everybody.